there is an inventory problem, which makes clothing the second most wasteful uh, industry in the world. Having this set up to be a one-for-one -one model, we're really not making clothing unless a customer wants it. At the end of a season, we don't have anything to throw out because there's no inventory in our business. Uh -huh. For the consumer, 70% of women, at least, are between standard sizes. The standard size system is extremely archaic, and it's not really fitting the diversity of body shapes that are out there. You're listening to Someday List, a podcast by To Do. Every month, we're sitting down with some of our favorite creatives, founders, and entrepreneurs to talk about what they're doing, how they got there, and what they want to tackle next. I'm your host, Evan Lian, and today I'm talking to Mark Zhang, co founder of Scene, a sizeless custom clothing company. Together with his co founder, Ray, he's built a company that creates pieces one to one for each of its customers. They carry zero inventory. We dig into how they managed to pull that off, what exactly sizeless means, and why it's top of mind for so many retailers right now. We also dig into what he's learned as a founder so far and how his relationship to work has changed in the midst of it. Before we get started, if you're looking for an easy way to get organized, look no further. To Do is a thoughtfully constrained minimalist to-do list app that is as simple as paper. Because we believe that simple stays organized. To Do helps you focus on the things you need to get done so you have more time for the things that matter. Start your 30-day free trial at todo.com or download the free mobile app. On to the interview. Welcome back to Someday List. Today we're joined by Mark Zhang, co-founder of Scene a sizeless custom clothing company. We're going to get into what that means, but first things first, Mark, thank you for joining us today. How are you doing? Good. Just uh, surviving the winter storm here. So Mark and I actually go way back, uh, essentially grew up together. You're like this, lived the street over, but that's not really what we're here to talk about today. Uh, you are a co-founder of this company scene. It, it's been really incredible to watch it grow over the last couple of years and, and watch this sort of founder journey that you've been on. Can you tell me a little bit about scene and what your role is there? Yeah, so seeing we're a sizeless clothing company that's made with AI. So mm -hmm. usually you would choose a size for any of the styles that you would shop. But for us, there are no sizes on our site. What you would do is you would take a 60 second quiz. We ask for questions like your height, your weight, body shape, fit preferences, no measurements needed at all. And then we would translate those answers that you give us into exact measurements. What happens after that is we cut and sew your clothing based on those exact measurements. It's not matched to like our close standard size or anything like that. My role in the company has been to develop our smart fit quiz, uh, the AI behind it, our operations, our finances, that sort of thing. So really the back end. We're going to dig into that a little bit more. But prior to this, you were working as a valuation analyst uh, in the healthcare industry, correct? Uh, okay. And I've listened to a couple other interviews that you, you've you done, and you talk about a particular piece of feedback that you got from your boss at the time, which was essentially that you're the most efficient person on your team, the most billable hours, the most non-billable hours, because you did your work so efficiently. First question, I guess, is where does that sort of work ethic come from? Because I can imagine a world where if someone else were in those shoes, they might use that as an excuse to maybe ease their foot off the gas and phone it in a little bit. Where did you find the motivation? to work so diligently at a job that maybe you were less passionate about? So the job that I did, we were a third party to hospital corporations that wanted to acquire physician practices mm -hmm. happening in the U.S. a lot. What we would do is we would provide a legal statement to confirm that we declare that something is you know consistent with fair market value. We were writing legal documents all day on top of the analysis that we, we would do. And uh, I was, you know, I was churning these out. Uh, it's a service-based business. So really it's about how efficient you are per hour, which I took it upon myself to be a challenge. I just got annoyed, uh, you know, just falling asleep at the, <laughs> at the desk, trying to write the same thing over and over again. And the situations are slightly different. Uh -huh. You know, the numbers may come out different. The location of the hospital may have been different, but essentially the legalese of everything was effectively the same. Mm -hmm. And so I remember sitting there thinking, there's got to be something better than this. This is horrible. And so I created, it wasn't like extremely pretty or anything, but uh, in an Excel document, I put in the template language for all the different situations. And I essentially created a form for anybody in the company that wanted to use it. They could go through and plug in the information that would change from each case to case that we reviewed. 
mm-hmm. but effectively put it into a, a legal statement at the end and yeah. you could just download it. And so what would take 30 minutes for the easiest cases that we reviewed would take 30 minutes. I could do in like five to 10 minutes. It was just out of boredom. And I think I just always try to find more efficient ways to do things. It did offer me a lot of free time in that sense too. I was able to get through work uh, a lot quicker than some of my coworkers. Now, would you say that you are uh, in that sense, more of a, like a a right brained or left brained? I I think left is the the analytical one. It's funny because I think in my family, I have three other siblings and they're all right brained um, and creative thinking. And for me, I don't know, just some part of the, the way I was raised or what clicked for me was always the analytical part. That's kind of also what I've brought to scene as well. Like I think uh, my, my co-founder, Ray, who's also my cousin, he's on the product marketing side of things for the business. Mm-hmm. For me, back in operations, trying to figure out the numbers and make them work. We just complement each other really well in that way. So I am curious about the timeline. Obviously, you had time on your hands while you were at this previous job. Uh, when did the conversations around scene start? Was there any time between these two jobs for you to do some soul searching or was it like you jumped right into the scene? Yeah. So at the job that I was working at, um, I was bored out of my mind. So at this time, it's probably around 2017 where yeah. I'm, I'm like year two into the job and it, yeah, I was trying to find other things to keep me entertained. So mm-hmm. I had started, um, Really briefly, it didn't even probably launch, I think, like a food podcast on the food scene in Nashville. Nashville was blowing up at the time. And I was there because it's also the center of healthcare in the US. Uh-huh. So a lot of our clients were there too. So um, Southern food was something new for me. And I had loved uh, you know, diving into the food scene and found somebody who wanted to do a podcast with me. I also, at the time, launched a finance blog. I was really into personal finances and I wanted to share my learnings with people. After that too, there was a um, so some national competition through healthcare.gov or something like that, where they wanted to figure out a better billing system, which uh-huh. is a big need on the healthcare system. And yeah. I like entered a, a comp- like a business idea into that competition. So you can imagine I was, I was really bored. I, you know, I think being a part of a startup was something I was interested in, but Nashville being what it is, didn't have very many. So was seeking a way out. My mm-hmm. cousin at the time reached out to me and he had this brand that was previously called suitable and had, had pivoted into something called scene where he opened a retail store. He was doing custom clothing for more traditional products, wool suits and, mm-hmm. and dress shirts, that sort of thing. He also had a few casual styles, but effectively like a clothing brand made for like the modern man. Mm-hmm. And he asked me to help him with a few tasks because it was pretty much him at the time mm-hmm. and maybe a few retail employees. Yeah. So yeah, I, I stepped in and helped out for a couple of months. And I think at the end of 2017, he reached out and said, what do you think about coming on full time? At that moment, when I saw what he was doing and I, I paid off all my school loans while I was in Nashville. I was making a decent salary. Uh-huh. And so, uh, you know, to me, I was like, well, I, I am young. I think I was 26 at the time. I thought, you know, if, if I'm ever going to take a chance now is the best time. Um, and you know, it was a company coming in where basically I, I would be a co-founder, even though I didn't start with the, um, original part of the business, it was mm-hmm. effectively still at its infant stages. Mm-hmm. So uh, I took like maybe, I don't know, a month to think about it. I even visited LA to make sure my now wife would be happy with moving to LA. <laughs> you know, once that was figured out, yeah, I, I, I quit my job and, and yeah. decided to jump all in. So when Ray asked you to come on at, in, in this co-founder capacity, was there a defined set of problems that he wanted assistance with or, or, or that you were saying, hey, this is what I can help you do? Yeah, that, I think mostly it was he had operations to figure out. And I don't mm-hmm. even think he knew what his biggest problems were. Maybe he had like a job in general. He said, we needed help with uh, production, overseeing production with our manufacturers. But I came in and my brain instantly jumped to making it more efficient. The process to package up measurements at mm-hmm. the time was manual. Most retail brands with inventory, you know, small, medium, large sizes, they create those patterns ahead of time before they launch it. Mm-hmm. And the factories turn out, you know, inventory, right? You, you yeah. get like a hundred each, each size. 
And pretty much once you get that inventory, you just sell it. But for us, you know, the production really happens after the customer orders it. So every individual order required specific attention because at the time we had the retail store, we were measuring people. So mm-hmm. we'd have to take those measurements, package it up into a, you know, an Excel sheet and, and give it to our manufacturers very, very early stages. Mm-hmm. So I came in and I was trying to make, I instantly figured, tried to figure out how to make that process a little bit more efficient, mm-hmm. you know, how we collect measurements, package it easily for our manufacturers and, and send it off. And it was obvious at the time that we needed um, a tech solution. And uh, personally, for me, I, I was also interested in coding myself. I didn't, I don't have a background in coding mm-hmm. in any way, but I had taken a course in college and had like dabbled in it with my, myself. So I was able to, at the very least, before we could hire our own developers, you know, create some sort of automated way to figure out how to get those measurements to our manufacturer. And at the time we weren't online at all. So the smart fit quiz and shopping online wasn't really a thing. We were just trying to figure out how to do it for the store. So when you're coming on in this new capacity, this is a new industry altogether. How do you get caught up to speed on the retail space, the fashion space, everything you're about to have to figure out now that it's sort of do or die as a founder? It was eye-opening for me. I actually thought that I knew a decent amount about clothing, but uh, no, I didn't know anything. So (laughs) (laughs) I thought I knew brands and everything, but really I just knew the big retailers. Yeah. And coming to LA was eye-opening. I mean, we were, our store was on La Brea Avenue, Mm -hmm. a store famous for streetwear and outdoor wear. So Mm -hmm. here we are, this strange custom suit brand, like on the same block as uh, Stone Island, Mm -hmm. OVO. Mm -hmm. Also next to us, we had... um, what was it? There's an outdoor. I can't think of an outdoor. The one with the fox brand, uh, the fox logo. Fall Raven. Fall Raven. Yes, yeah, yeah. there you go. Uh, Fall Raven, and um, there was like a, a second one too that I can't remember. But yeah. surrounded by yeah streetwear and outdoor wear, and uh, one block one block over on Fairfax where you know, streetwear started in LA. Most of the streetwear brands were out right there, and for me, it, I was lucky that I think it's good that obviously I had an interest in clothing, so I just like dove head into it. I mean. The first thing you, you do is you get on Instagram and you make sure to follow these accounts to just see what their creative teams are putting out. Mm-hmm. But you also learn about the process of how the clothing is made. You learn about how different retailers, you know, design for their product and how they think through the branding, like the storyline behind each of the their brands. And I just have a genuine interest in that. I think that there was some part of my creativity activated through the, through the brand, which I didn't think I needed necessarily. Mm-hmm. Like I always came in thinking I wanted to do the analytical stuff and improving the operations and lowering mm-hmm. costs. But the creative aspect is fun for me too. Mm-hmm. And while it's not my everyday sort of thing, just naturally being one of the partners in the brand, uh, I'm just involved in those conversations and those are really fun for me. Yeah. So you talk about this previous iteration of the business where there was the retail space. Now you guys are strictly D2C, you're online. And there is sort of this reinvention of what the business and the business model is. I was listening to an interview Ray d- had done and and he had said with the retail space, you were something like two months from running out of cash. Like how long was the writing on the wall that something needed to change with the business model? And what were some of the signposts that were telling you something has to change? That's funny because I think I came in and I think within two months, I, I looked at the numbers for the business and I was like, I was, I told Ray, I was like, I don't think this works. <laughs> we should shut, we should shut down this store. Um, two months coming into the the business. And uh-huh. I think we didn't shut down the store for another year. So yeah. you can imagine how long that went on for. So we came in and I think right away we started coming up with ideas to try to generate sales. One of the main things you always do as a retailer is let's put things on sale. So we tried that and had like a short term <laughs> success, but sales are really, really short term. So after that, we had to figure things out and we were back and forth on figuring out, okay, how do we get people to come to a store? We tried Facebook ads, driving traffic to the store. We tried various things online. I said, well, you know, let's try to sell online to supplement the cost of the store. And one of the ideas we had was um, something called like a try on box. Mm -hmm. And because we were custom at the time and we required measurements, you know, we were asking people like, well, we were thinking, oh, well, people, they always ask for fabrics, like being able to touch the fabric. They can't come into our store. Mm -hmm. Reasonable. And we had all this inventory in the store where if the store wasn't having enough food traffic, that's those samples were just sitting there, just wasting Mm -hmm. our money, taking up space. 
<laughs> so we thought, why not get these try on samples out to our customers? They get to try it on, feel it for themselves. We would send the closest size and they're going to ship it back to us. We would keep those samples, but we would make adjustments off the standard size that they put on. And what ended up happening with that situation, a um, terrible, terrible situation where I think the way we set up our site, it didn't have a way to reject fraudulent cards. Mm -hmm. And so there was this period of time when we first launched, we don't know how people discovered our site, mm -hmm. but we definitely got way more traffic than normal and ended up getting like tens of try on box orders. People mm -hmm. wanted to try on the clothing and then ship it back to us. Mm -hmm. Or so we thought. Um, like one weekend we shipped out all these samples. Um, my wife even helped me. And the idea was that we would try to convert, you know, 10% of the people that ordered a try on box. Uh -huh. And I forgot what triggered us figuring out that they were fraudulent. Maybe it was because I was getting into the actual orders and noticed that like Shopify, which we use, uh, was flagging it or that something like that, where we realized that we couldn't charge the people for the samples if they kept it. Uh -huh. And we ended up losing thousands of dollars of inventory because we had shipped out all the samples and nobody <laughs> was sitting in the back. We had no way to charge them for it. Yeah, That was January of 2019. And it felt like probably one of the lowest of lows where it was like the store wasn't working and we just gave away like a bunch of free clothes online. Mm -hmm. And it was just like the worst, felt like the worst situation. We would never back out from that. At that point, after that happened, maybe a month later, we decided, okay, we have to do something new. The store isn't working. So we, we uh -huh. decided to look for a blesser and move the business online. And actually at, at the time, what we decided to do parallel pathing with closing the store was we decided to launch a Kickstarter. I might be getting ahead, but yeah, we launched no, a Kickstarter at the same time as the store was closing. So the day we closed the store down officially, we launched the Kickstarter and then we moved out of the store. It took a couple of weeks to move out of the store. The day we were officially out of the store was the day of the, our Kickstarter closing. It was only two weeks. Uh -huh. um, and that kind of like kickstarted our online journey. I mean, what were the conversations like with your co-founder at the time? Because I imagine you're having this sort of crisis and you had said you flagged it pretty early on. You were there for about two months. Uh, was there a point where you doubted the the legs of, of this business idea or did your confidence ever falter in it did you have like a i told you so moment or anything i would say yeah the conversations when i came in it was definitely a confidence thing that made us keep going i i think ray's um really the optimistic one and in, in uh, our partnership mm -hmm. and it comes in handy many many times <laughs> as an entrepreneur you just you, you have to be optimistic if you're downer all the time you really will spiral out of control because every day something will go wrong. And so to have someone optimistic on a team and he's just like, well, I think we can make this work. And I was only in two months, you know, what did I know? And I mean, I was only maybe three years into working as a adult. You know, I told him, you know, this is not looking great. And he said, well, I think uh, we just got to solve these things and then it'll work. And I was like, well, okay, <laughs> let's do it. We continued to do that until it, it just seemed like it was really the end. And I think the numbers convinced him. Throughout the year, I wasn't like, oh, let's go back to my original suggestion. Like, I really tried to make things work. Uh -huh. I think we were always going through ideas. And I think the biggest thing I learned at the end of that was just having the confidence in my own opinion uh -huh. and the ability to read a situation and trust my gut. You know, it's a give and take in any of these partnerships. Most of the time, it falls in the gray area and you compromise on like everyday decisions. But there's some larger brand level, company wide level decisions where those are things you really want to sit down and think through, make mm -hmm. sure you know exactly what you want and um, make sure to get that point across. So it, it was um, a learning process for me. And I think I learned a lot from yeah. that first year for sure. So then what is the, the aha moment where you land on this sizeless custom clothing? Like how did you f come to formulate that hypothesis and like, Hey, we might be onto something. Was it through, customer feedback or just like sitting there, you know, staring at a blank sheet of paper, trying to figure it out. I was actually on the floor of the retail store. And so I was measuring customers, meeting them in person. I was, you know, measuring their sleeve length, their chest, their stomach, their, you know, everything for like a suit generally. Mm -hmm. And I started to be able to memorize measurements and I could look at a person and size them up. 
and be like, well, you're like a 42 long or whatever. <laughs> Not only could I figure out their standard size, but I could also name off their measurements. You know, if I, if I measured their chest or their stomach, there's, I could like predict some of the other measurements on their body mm -hmm. because it, it's just generally speaking, your height and your weight, it just correlates with certain measurements. And this is around when the try on box failed. I thought to myself, well, I can predict people based off of certain facts that they give me. Why can't I make that automated? Uh -huh. And so what we ended up doing around that time is online, we did launch what is now the smart fit quiz. They ask a series of questions, which I felt like were important for me gaining knowledge in the store, actually measuring the customers. Mm -hmm. And I thought to myself, you know, how can I get to a place where I get those measurements for the customer and have it be close enough to where, you know, all they need is like a remake or alterations. So that's really the impetus of it all. Like we needed a solution online. I also just had a lot of experience measuring people, thousands of customers over the course of a year and a half. We had a storage of like all of their measurements. Uh -huh. And so I could use that to help predict the next person that came in through the door. Um, but it, it also became the database which SmartFit is based upon, and mm -hmm. that helps predict customers' measurements today. So you guys had a really successful Kickstarter. Uh, you guys have done some fundraising in addition to that. So when you're pitching Scene, or in your own opinion, is, is Scene a fashion company? Is it a technology company? A little bit of everything. To me, it's more of a technology company that happens to be a, a fashion brand. Uh -huh. I think that the driver between everything that we do is... It requires technology, you know, the way, of course, the way we figure out measurements for the customers, but even the platform that we've created to provide the measurements back to the customer, give those measurements to the factory, being able to create this service that allows us to have feedback from the customer and, and communicate with our factories. All of that is technology driven. It would not be possible without that. And it's possible for us to plug and play right at the moment. We have just our own brand, but what's exciting about the platform is that we can bring others onto this platform with us mm -hmm. pretty quickly. If they want a sizeless program per se for their own retail brand, we can um, plug in their inputs that they have for their styles and smart fit quiz will be able to also predict measurements for any of their customers. And then it's of course the manufacturing side. We don't, we're not vertically integrated in that way, but our manufacturing partners are set up in a unique way that technology only has enabled. Most retailers, it takes a very costly amount to create these patterns for a small, medium, large. And then they have a process to churn out a large quantity of each individual size because it's the same every time. But to be able to manufacture individual pieces of clothing from scratch to specific measurements, that requires a flipping upside down of the whole process. Yeah, And you really need to have a way to automate cutting patterns into specific measurements, which our manufacturer partners can do. Yeah, Because of technology, those costs have come down and that's why we're able to sell our clothing at a comparable price to standard size clothing. This interview is brought to you by To Do. You're juggling a lot and you don't know where to start. We've all been there. And that's why we made To Do with the core belief that less is more. To Do is the minimalist to-do list app to ease your cognitive burdens. We are the most refreshing task manager in a sea of monster energy drinks. No pings, no feeds, no comments, just you and the things you need to get done in a simple, intuitive interface. Use code SOMEDAYLIST for 20% off when you subscribe at teuxdeux.com. Back to the interview. So, custom bespoke clothing sizeless clothing is perhaps the main selling point but the other part of the story is this change in consumer behavior or perception in how we think about clothes and uh i saw something about um recently shein being named the top fashion brand of 2022 and i think it's easy to hear uh, you know the term fast fashion and know to like wag your finger at it and say that's bad but uh for me, as just a regular everyday consumer, like it might be perhaps difficult to grasp the actual scale of the problems that that whole industry creates. What exactly is the scope of the problem of fast fashion and, and how is seen sort of addressing that? I think the biggest thing is that our clothing is one for one. We don't make the clothing unless the customer buys it first. The flip side of that is brands like Sheen that create a massive amount of clothing 
And because of consumer preferences these days, they are nimble with their manufacturing. They have to come out with styles quickly because trends are even faster than they were before. What happens is that there is an inventory problem, which leads to a lot of the waste, which makes clothing the second most wasteful uh, industry in the world, where a lot of pieces of clothing at the end of a season, whatever that means these days, it could be, <laughs> it's not I don't know, six months or any anymore. It could be as short as three months. Um, a lot of pieces of clothing are thrown out at the end because they're not on trend anymore or the season has moved on. They had created a lot of inventory for that period of time and they weren't able to sell through it. So they got to make space for the next season, which is, which leads to clothing being thrown out, mm -hmm. not to mention the labor practices to get clothing at that price point that they have. So it's just not the most sustainable practice, uh -huh. of course. And so the way we're doing with our manufacturers and having this set up to be a one for one model, we're really not making clothing unless a customer wants it. And at the end of a season, you know, our company, not ex exactly seasonal based with a stretch suit that we have. It's material sourced from Japan. That's very comfortable to wear. It's bomber jackets. These are kind of like year round styles. We also have denim sourced from Japan made into jeans. Those are year round styles as well. Uh -huh. So, you know, there's at the end of a season, we don't have anything to throw out because there's no inventory in our business. Uh -huh. The other side of it for the consumer who may not see that aspect of the business, 70% of women at least are between standard sizes. Mm -hmm. You know, the standard size system for women is extremely archaic and was built up to where it's it's not really fitting uh, for the diversity of body shapes that are out there. And so you have this problem where you're just not able to find clothing many times. Maybe certain pieces of clothing may fit you with certain brands and you found those and you love those, but there are certain styles even you've just kind of given up on because you're not able to find the right fit for your frame. And so custom is really a, a solution to figuring out how to solve that fit problem for a lot of our customers. Mm -hmm. And we just see in a world where everything is becoming personalized to an individual, you can see people that are growing up with algorithms and they understand how to tailor their algorithm. It's not even playlists anymore, right? That used to be the thing on like Spotify where you use like, I've got a curation. And now people are understanding how to curate the algorithm to speak to them about what they recommend. <laughs> yeah, It's on Netflix, it's on Spotify with their TikTok algorithm. You know, you comment on certain TikToks to make sure you stay with a certain type of content. Uh -huh. And people are starting to really play into that. And I think that's just going to continue being the trend and clothing uh, is kind of lagging behind in that sense. We're able to personalize clothing to where it's made for the customer instead of the customer trying to shop a bunch of different brands and figure out how can they find a brand that fits them or the brand that comes to the customer and figures out how it fits the customer. We have been talking to some of the larger corporate brands that have been established since the early 1900s and on all of their agendas, their goal is to become sizeless in the next five to 10 years. And so this is a big thing, inventory and the return rates and th that sort of thing. It's a, it's a big problem that these retailers are always facing, no matter how big they are, uh -huh. the smallest of brands, the largest of brands. And so sizeless is something that is just, um, is something that uh, every big retailer is interested in. You said fashion's the second most wasteful industry in the world. I think I saw on your site that it generates somewhere around like $5 billion of waste every year. But this unlock you know, this, this new realization with the business and, and, and sort of uh, rethinking what the business model was has been massively successful for you guys. You guys had the Kickstarter. You guys have been featured in Forbes and Business Insider. Uh, I've seen uh, seen described as the Netflix of fashion. So I, I think that really speaks to just that you've uncovered this nugget of truth. I would love to know as a founder of this company for 2023, what things are, are top of mind for you and where would you like to see it go in, in the next year, next couple of years? Yeah, the biggest thing for us is always to make the sizeless clothing available to as many people as possible. A lot of people always ask, oh, is our competition like the traditional suit companies that are tailors and they have shops you know, around the US? Mm -hmm. Not really our competition. I think the biggest thing for us is most of our customers come to us. They've never ordered a piece of custom clothing in their life. Mm -hmm. And they're ordering something sizeless for the first time because it's a it's a problem that they're experiencing in their own lives. A lot of women come to us and they had just like given up on denim altogether as a category. And being able to shop custom denim 
is something that's new for them. A lot of our men also, even for suits, they're ordering suits, but it's not something that they ordered custom before. They they would come and they would just order off the rack. But being able to have an experience that skips the tailor completely, and you're able to order something custom made, unique to them, and uh, you know it takes like 60 seconds to figure it out. It solves a, a real pain point for them. So our goal is to make that as mass market as possible. I think the biggest thing there is that with our own brand, some of the limitations that we have is that we have, we're limited by the amount of traffic our site has and our reach as a brand. We're going to continue growing that. Mm-hmm. And we think that the categories that we can enter into, that sort of thing easily can be a $100 million brand. But I think another part of it in terms of achieving mass market is to really partner with larger brands that are looking to solve this problem for themselves. So the platform that we've created, we're really setting it up now so that it's an easy plug and play situation where other brands can come in. They say they want to start their own size program. Maybe we'll start off using our manufacturing partners and uh, providing our smart fit platform on their site. They're able to create their profile, which can be accessible after they order the first time. They can come back and say, I'd like to use the same profile fit that they had for a specific style. They could use it across any styles across a a company's website. It also unlocks the ability to shop at different websites that use our SmartFit platform. Mm -hmm. And so they can come in and they can say, you know, you have a a account created on, I don't know, let's just say Levi's for jeans. You can come to our site and your profile is saved as well. So it, it creates this network effect where that profile is across many different brands. You're able to have a simpler shopping experience and you're able to have something that's completely custom made for yourself. We still believe that brands are important behind this idea and how you want to shop in a specific category. It should be simple in terms of the size that you have. And we're hoping to uh, enable that in the next few years. Um, Something uh, uh, maybe on a more personal level, as you've gone through these phases of growth with scene, has your relationship with work changed? Yes, it definitely has. I think I was influenced by a lot of friends that I graduated with. They went on to consulting, banking, maybe not so much tech, but at least the the banking and consulting were super hot after we had graduated. I saw that some of the hours that they were pulling off and it it just kind of felt like if you weren't working that hard, you know, it just meant that you aren't working in a legitimate job or something. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Something Something like that, I think, affected me in some way. So when I went to the startup, and of course, at the time, I think there was this hustle culture that is associated with entrepreneurship, where you know you work seven days a week, you don't go to any of your friends' weddings, and you uh, you don't sleep as much at night. I think that definitely played a part in how I worked when I first started. Just unconsciously, like just weirdly strange where I told myself that's what I needed to do to make the brand successful. The thing about that is after a year of doing that, (laughs) you realize how many bad ideas you go through (laughs) when you work a lot. Uh I mean, that's kind of what it is. And some entrepreneurs may still believe that they think like, well, if you didn't work all those hours, you wouldn't have landed on a good idea. But I think the quality of somebody who is uh, effective at getting a a company off the ground is their ability to sift through bad decisions and good decisions. Mm -hmm. They can tell very quickly as ideas are coming up, they can tell down the road, like where that's going. It's kind of like in poker where, sorry to all the newer players, (laughs) when you play poker, you don't value the decision that you made to bet on a certain pair of cards whether or not the result was correct, uh-huh. right? You don't tap yourself on the shoulder. You're like, good decision if the cards that show up allow you to win the hand. The better way to play poker is to understand, you know, the odds of each hand and if the decision making to go in were right. So that's why pro poker players lose to new poker players all the time because sometimes those new poker players, they just get lucky. Uh-huh. But over time, those pro poker players make a really good living because they are consistently making good decisions. But the same way in entrepreneurship and with making decisions in business, that hustle culture made me think at first, whatever the result was, the and justify the means, like it took whatever it takes to get to that end result. And mm-hmm. in some cases, I think when your back is to the wall, you need to find a solution 
you do kind of have to like work hard in order to make it happen. Things have to happen, right? Because if you don't do it, you know, the business fails. But I, I'm talking more of the situation of like every day in your, your company's life is not in threat, like threatened mm-hmm. that way. Um, and I think I had worked in a way where I just hustled as hard as I could and tried to do as many things as I can. And over time, you pick up experience and you start to one, understand, oh, that's a bad decision. Like I, don't, I definitely don't even want to do that. But back in the day, I might have just did it because it was something... I had time, I thought I had time for, and I should do it uh-huh. because I'm an entrepreneur and I need to hustle. The thing I realized was after all that hustling, I think I still made a series of a ton of bad decisions, you know, <laughs> and it wasn't even effective. So it's, it's like the, uh-huh. it just goes back to like work smarter, not harder. And I think it's so true in that sense. I saw like, I suffered along the way, you know, and I, I wasn't really seeing people. I, I didn't go out to make a lot of friends in LA, even though I had just moved there. And I think it, it took a toll on me in that way. And I, kind of vowed to myself, I promised to myself to live a more balanced lifestyle. And I can only do that with confidence because I went through a year of bad decisions and I started to learn from them. And so you start to make better decisions, which allows your time to be a little bit more efficient. You set up processes around yourself. You, you know, with, I'm extremely grateful for this, but with luck, we were able to hire a few people onto our team to maybe take off some of the workload. Mm -hmm. That's definitely a luxury not every entrepreneur has, but I think for us, we're starting to grow in that way. So that's that's how I've seen it. Drilling into that a little bit, what is sort of in your day to day operating system so you can protect that balance within your life? How do you like to stay organized, uh, or how do you even you know uh, delegate or manage your team? For us, is we have team leads for the operations that I oversee. We have fulfillment, mm-hmm. we have production, we have um, customer service. We've got a team lead for each area of focus. I like to operate with a decentralized system of leading. I tell my team this is I like to trust them with their ability to make a decision without you know needing me to approve it. So the more I'm involved, the less I can focus on the overall vision of the company and taking it where we want to go long term. Mm-hmm. So I try to enable our team leads to do that, to not come to me as much as possible. I always train them and, and give feedback in a way where I said, like, how would you make a decision in this case as you have brought it to me and not jump to giving my answer or whatever it is just to like make it short. Because mm-hmm. I think long-term that puts a toll on, on my workload for myself. I think I always just rely on a simple checklist each day. The easier it is to just write down and cross out the more effective it is. Mm-hmm. And so my list is messy, yeah. but I can really add to it and cut out things that are coming in each day. Yeah. That has been the most effective for me. I think I've seen templates and complicated methods for like Notion and Trello and people have these like complicated to-do lists mm-hmm. and they never work for me because it's so hard to sustain, to even add an item to the list that I just end up not doing it because it takes too much time to come up with the list. I used to write it down on like a, just a notepad, that was my easiest way. And I was great at just crossing things out. Now I am using just like the notepad app on my, mm-hmm. on a MacBook. Well, boy, do um, I have an app you. for you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, I was, uh, I was studying the app and I was just like, maybe I should get this yeah. one. We'll, we'll hook like, you up. So, you know, this realization that balance uh, is very important in your life. What are the things that you're doing outside of work that that help you maintain it and, and that you really cherish and want to protect now? Oh, um, well, spending time with my wife, we uh, recently married in like just before the pandemic hit. Mm. And um, I think spending time with her is important to me having a balanced lifestyle. And now as offices are opening up, like we are not going to be seeing each other as often um, where in the pandemic, of course, we were just seeing each other every day. So that, that, that's, an, that's an important priority for me. We also picked up tennis in the pandemic. It's not something I ever played in my life. Mm -hmm. We both love the sport. Health and fitness is important to me now as we get older. And uh, tennis was like something great to pick up. Obviously, you can play that sport till you're like 70. And I think learning that has been really fun with her. And I think making time for it is hard because generally speaking, you try to play an hour and a half. Mm -hmm. And at one point, you know, we were playing four to five times a week. Uh, and, and in the winter, it kind of dies down a little bit, but we're still able to play two to three times a week in um, LA because it's year round out there. Making time for those things, 
are just important. I, I also want to make time to be able to travel, to be able to work remotely while I'm, while I get to travel, like such as right now, while I'm, while I'm in Michigan, visiting my family. And yeah, all of that is in the hope that the people that are most important in my life, I give them time of the day. I hate hearing about those stories uh, where certain entrepreneurs, you know, they're just, they're not connected with their family over, you know, so many years of working so hard. Mm -hmm. And Props up. Maybe there's a lot of success in that too. Um, I don't know, but I, I, I think that I'm not, I'm not trying to be like a hundred billion dollar brand or being leaving like a massive legacy. That's sort of thing. I, I think our idea is big, and I hope that we can work towards it. But uh, to me, I think the sacrifice along the way, it's not necessarily even the better strategy, mm -hmm. and it's not also worth it to me personally. Yeah, I think that's very admirable, especially in a time where. Maybe we're starting to realize that ruthless, limitless capitalism is not <laughs> a net positive necessarily. Um, I got one last question uh, for you before we hang up. All this talk about um, systems and decision making and being very analytical and studious just reminds me of uh, in high school, we used to hang out after school every day and play like GameCube and you would kick my ass at at uh super smash bros melee <laughs> and mario kart because you were meticulous oh, you had learned like the falco spike or the what the ice climber stuff and it, it's just very funny to me but for old time's sake it's, yeah. it, was annoying, <laughs> it was on the receiving end of it yeah. <laughs> um uh for old time's sake what did you think of the new mario trailer <laughs> Yeah, I love um, that they're doing that. I think, um, how has it not happened yet? Mm -hmm. I am a, a little disappointed. I don't know if they'll actually go through it. It sounds like they're going to go through it. I'm a little disappointed. It doesn't have an Italian accent. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Same. It's kind of just weird to me, like Mario with a, an American accent. It's like um, Sonic with teeth when that happened. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so that part is a little disappointing. I hope the movie is good. Mario Kart shows up in the movie yeah, <laughs> and like Rainbow Road does. And I hope they do the shortcut because I remember many times we were just like attempting these shortcuts over and over again until we could uh -huh. get them. The one in Rainbow Road is the most difficult ones to yeah. pull off. That just brings back a lot of childhood memories. So I hope they do like a lot of nostalgic things mm -hmm. for the, uh, the audio. Yeah, me too. I, uh, I really appreciate you indulging me and, and taking the time out of your day to do this. But for our listeners, where can we find uh, you or seen online? I think the easiest thing, remember, we're from L.A. So uh, the website is S-E-N-E -E dot L-A. And our Instagram is seen studio. So S-E-N-E -E studio um, and TikTok, too. We're on all those platforms. So that's, uh, that's the best way to find us. Uh, our Instagram is a great way to kind of get the vibe of our brand, um, our marketing team, Ray has done a fantastic job in creating our, our profile and what we're about as a brand. So check that out. All right. Uh, well, that'll do it for this episode of Someday List. We will catch you next time. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Someday List. We will have more interviews for you each month. So make sure to follow the show on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or follow along on social media at to do app on Instagram or TikTok and at to do on Twitter. This podcast is produced by to do our theme music is composed by Evan Laybourne. I want to thank our guest Mark for coming on the show again. And of course, thank you the listener. We will catch you next time.